make a start. So in this <coughs> session, introduction to MGS data, I want to uh, very briefly recap the basics of DNA, uh, for a good reason, uh, then introduce what DNA sequence is and how that works, and then also explain how Illumina MGS data, sequencing data is generated. The reason why I'm focusing on Illumina is because this is what the vast, very vast majority of ancient DNA will be sequenced on for reasons which I'll also explain later. So first, to actually understand how sequencing works, we need to look at, just do a very, very brief recap of what DNA is. <clears throat> so DNA, as you probably, everybody knows, is um, a, a double helix molecule which is stored in every single cell in your body. And this double helix is actually made up of four main components um, called nucleotides, which you can see here. And they are, consist of two strands um, in which sort of uh, these four nucleotides will, will come together and bind together uh, in a particular order. And these four nucleotides are made up of <clears throat> two groups, pyrimidines and purines. Um, so pyrimidines are cytosines and thymines, and purines are guanines and adenines. And this base pairing, which brings the two uh, strands of the DNA together, always consists of one pyrimidine and one purine. And I always remember which group go together. And so I remember it as C always goes with the G, think CGI, and then go A with T. What's some of the best CGI you've ever seen? It's from Star Wars, so think AT, AT Walker, Antat Walker. You hopefully never need to remember that. So what this means, and because they go together, it always means they're complementary. So whenever you find a C on one strand of the DNA molecule, you will see a G on the other and vice versa. And again, A with a T on the other. So depending on which strand you are reading, you can always get the order of the base on the other strand because of this um, complementary base pairing. Um, and this is important because this is how, essentially how replication occurs. So when you basically make a copy of the DNA strand. Um, to put it in very simple terms, what we do is, or what the body does, is unwinds the, the multiple um, various macro structures, including the double helix. You then separate the strands into two. So you have um, <clears throat> your oligonucleotides are basically exposed, so you don't have them binding together. And then you get a, an enzyme called a DNA poly polymerase, which basically attaches onto the strands, starts reading, reading along it. And when it finds an exposed nucleotide, it will say, well, okay, I recognize, for example, this is a C that's being exposed. And it waits to basically pick up a free nucleotide floating around in the cellular gunk, and then basically allows it to bind together um, in that position. Then it basically will move along to the next exposed nucleotide, see what it is, let's say it's an A, and then it will basically wait to find a T and stick and sticks it on the, the, the strand. And eventually another enzyme, I believe, comes along, I can't remember what the name, I did, name is, comes along and basically repairs the backbone, like Anyway, it doesn't matter. Prepares the backbone to basically then have your two um, strands from your original strand. And just remember basically having this enzyme, picking up free nucleotides and adding it to the new strand. Because this is the important thing for sequencing as we'll in a minute. Um, as a reminder, how we get DNA. So when you do this, you basically um, get your sample. You then have to break down the cells, the cell walls and membranes. Um, uh, and then you basically have to destroy a lot of stuff inside the cell that's not the DNA, so things like um, RNAs, proteins, and things like this, um, because this can basically inhibit your DNA replication downstream in your sort of molecular um, steps. You then separate out the DNA from the rest of the broken stuff, um, which you can then pull out. And normally in modern DNA, this can actually look like a long, this sort of spaghetti-like um, thing. However, DNA is a bit different. The process is the same. You basically have to break down the, the tissue. In this case, it's, let's say, bone. So you have to demineralize it to um, uh, release all of the biomolecules. Um, and you have to degrade all the other stuff. But the DNA molecules are also degraded. So they're already fragmented, so they're very short. They're very damaged, so they have modified nucleotides. And they also have contamination. So basically, your, your small fragments DNA is sitting in a super modern DNA. So a lot of these things will be covered in more detail in other later sessions. But you have to remember that they're damaged, they're old, they're very, very short. And this brings us on to DNA sequencing, which is essentially the conversion of the chemical, I suppose, chemical nucleotides 
Other DNA molecule, two human readable ACTG on your computer screen, and what we basically do all of our analyses on in genetics and genomics. And the way this works is pretty common across most methods, which is um, you replicate a strand, as I described a minute ago, but instead of adding just a standard nucleotide, you add a fluorophore modified nucleotide. So a fluorophore is a little um, molecule which essentially, when you um, excite it somehow, will emit a, a color. And in the case of DNA, you can have four different nucleotides um, and each one will emit a different color. And so quite often, the way you excite the fluorophore is firing a laser, which then emits the light and you record the color. And so when you're basically adding your nucleotide each time, you fire a laser, record the, take a picture of the color being emitted, uh, and then you know which base it is, and then you repeat on the next base, and next base, and next base. So historically, um, the, sort of the first sort of, let's say, mass production um, sequencing method was called Sanger sequencing. So what this involved was taking a, a DNA molecule making lots and lots of copies of it, but also fragmenting it in a random manner. So all of the, um, oh, sorry, yeah, fragmenting it. No, oh, I'm getting confused. One step ahead. Sorry, taking a DNA molecule, making lots of copies of it. Then you start extending the, the molecule, but instead of adding um, just no standard nucleotides, you mix in a few um, special modified nucleotides, which include essentially a blocker. And what this means is that once the polymerase gets to this particular blocking um, uh, nucleotide, it will not extend it any further. However, as you added a mixture of um, standard nucleotides and also these blocker nucleotides, your DNA molecules will be extended to somewhat a random le um, length each time. Because you have many, many different copies, um, in the end, you will uh, essentially have um, the in entirety of your original molecule um, covered as you can sort of see in this sort of step-like manner here. And what would happen once you basically have your randomly extended uh, molecules, but with these blockers, you would then send it through a capillary gel, which basically separates out the DNA molecules based on its length, and then you would fire a laser. And the important thing about these blocking nucleotides is also they were essentially fluorophores, so when you fire the laser, it'll emit a, a, a light. And as you basically see, have your DNA molecules going through the capillary gel, so they, the, the shorter ones going faster through the gel because of resistance and the longer ones going slower, you can basically record the order of the molecules going through the capillary gel. And I'm recording the light, you can basically see the different colors, and then with that you can basically count which um, base uh, is in your, in your DNA molecule as it goes through the capillary gel, and basically reconstruct the sequence by this method. However, um, this is the, the, the approach was actually not so good for um, high throughput DNA. So trying to reconstruct whole genomes, a lot of the original human uh, genome was um, generated with this, but this took 10 years, was extremely expensive, and it's also very, very resource hungry. You have to use a lot of polymerase, you have to use a lot of DNA, which again, when we deal with ancient DNA, which you get very small amounts because it's very degraded, it doesn't really work. Um, and then in about 2005, next generation sequencing, which is a bit of a misnomer to be honest, um, came along, where you can see sequence billions and billions of DNA molecules at once. Um, it's very, it was very fast and cheap and very much revolutionized gen genetics and pushed us into an era of genomics. And the market leader uh, was and still is, is a company called Illumina. There are others called PacBio and Iron Torrent, but really Illumina is the one that pretty much everybody uses nowadays for at least short, short read sequencing. And as I'm sure you're all aware, this is sort of these machines are more second generation now. Um, we have new machines like Oxford Nanopore, which basically do very long reads, packed bio to a certain extent, and that's sort of more a third generation that we're entering right now. Um, oh poop! Oh dear! So unfortunately, my pretty picture has been a video has been deleted. But what I want you to imagine is a big black. Uh, uh, window with lots of colored points and when I press play on all of these points they're going to start changing colors going from red to green to yellow to blue and this is happening thousands of times at once across this, across this big black um, screen um, and this is essentially the process of, of sequencing 
So what this black window that you should have been seeing would have been is something called a flow cell. Um, this is a glass slide, and on this glass slide is embedded, sort of bound to the base of this, is lots of um, short DNA sequences, synthetic DNA sequences called uh, oligos. Um, and what you do is essentially take your DNA and you basically inject it into the flow cell and your DNA will spread across the flow cell and start binding to this lawn. So imagine, literally imagine a like a grass lawn on the base of this, um, uh, this, this glass slide and basically all of your DNA molecules are attaching to these random um, synthetic nucleotides, uh, oligos. Um, but the question is, how is your DNA actually uh, binding onto this lawn and not basically get washed away as the, your, your sort of solution flows through the flow cell? What you do before injecting it into the flow cell is convert your DNA um, samples into something called a library. A library consists of adapters. Um, see, these are the, basically the complement uh, sequence of the oligos, of these synthetic oligos, which allow you to bind to the lawn of the flow cell. But uh, in addition to the adapters, you add um, onto DNA sequence things called priming sites. So this is where the enzymes will actually start, bind on to start copying the DNA. And also, when you're sequencing multiple samples at once on the same sequencing run, you can add things called indices, um, or known as barcodes, which are basically sample specific. So it allows you to mix multiple samples at once um, into one uh, sequencing run, sequence them all at the same time, and later on separate them out. So this is ultimately a slightly simplified version of a Illumina DNA construct. So the XXXXX in the middle, this is your target. So this is actually your DNA sequence from your sample. And then at both ends, you essentially have a target primer. So this is where your polymerase will bind on onto to start then actually going reading into your, your target or your, your, your insert is another phrase that you can call it. Then prior to the target primer, you also have an index. So this is actually your sample-specific barcode. This is actually added um, typically onto the adapter. And so this uh, happens in the, no, sorry. And the library construction, sorry, yeah. Um, at the library construction. And then also you have the adapter and index primer right at the beginning. So this is both um, what binds onto your the flow cell, but also acts as a, um, as a primer for actually reading the index, because you also need to sequence the index to know which DNA molecule, to which sample your DNA molecule is coming from. So once you've done this, in the Illumina sequencing, um, you have the problem that it, the fluorophores that will be adding to your DNA molecule, the light emitted, is not enough for a camera to pick up. It's much, much, much too small. You're dealing with these very, very small biomolecules. And so what you have to do is once your oligo has, or sorry, once your, your DNA molecule has bound to your flow cell, uh, sort of somewhere randomly, you start to make lots and lots and lots and lots of copies. So when you have lots of copies, that means that all the copies will emit the same nucleotide, sorry, the same color at once and make it the emission strong enough that, that a camera in the sequencer can actually take a picture and record what base it is. And um, the procedure of making these copies is called clustering. So what this consists of is you have your DNA molecule, which is bound to one of the uh, synthetic oligos on the lawn. And you basically do something called bridge amplification, where you basically bend over the DNA molecule. Sorry, sorry, I forgot. Your DNA molecule is single-stranded at the moment. So when you bind this over, bound, sorry, bend this over, so that the um, reverse complement will bind to the other oligo, a primer can bind on, and start reading across the molecule to reconstruct your double-stranded DNA. So you basically get the complement or reverse strand of your DNA molecule to double-stranded DNA. Then you add a, um, a primer to basically cut um, at one end or each end of the of the, uh, the DNA molecule on the two of the two different sort of forward and reverse uh, adapters to mean to result in two single-stranded again DNA. Um, Molecules, so basically the, the reverse complement of the DNA molecule, but you have one, uh, sorry, two strands. Then you do the same thing again, bend it over, reconstruct the, the, the full double stranded molecule again, separate it out, and do this many, 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 many different times. And basically, you have loads and loads and loads of copies of the same molecule in the same tiny little cluster, which is why you have clustering, in the same point on the flow cell. 
then prior to sequencing, you actually will cut all of one of these types off. So let's say you'd only be left with the, the purple ones to make sure you only have the same sequence, so not the reverse complement at the same time, but just the same sequence in one spot on your flow cell. Um, sorry, one second. This then leads us on to the actual sequencing process. Um, like I mentioned before, with the Sanger sequencing and replication, what you do is you basically have your single-stranded molecule. You'd have a prime, the primer at the priming site, sorry, prime to priming site at the enzyme for the polymerase. And then you start to add free-floating modified nucleotides, which have these fluorophores, which will basically emit your light. Um, so there is a slight difference to Sanger sequencing, however. So once you start add, your polymerase goes along, it starts adding in a, um, a free nucleotide, and then you have the fluorophore. Now, this fluorophore does block the next nucleotide being added on. So this makes sure, makes sure that on all of the molecules in your cluster, um, you're only adding the correct uh, nucleotide at one point. You then fire the laser, so the light is emitted. You take a photo. However, the difference here between Sanger sequencing and why actually um, Illumina sequencing or the sequencing by synthesis is much more resource sufficient is you can actually cut off this fluorophore, fluorophore and then basically repeat the process again. So rather than basically having your DNA molecule having one use of single use, you can sort of recycle the same DNA molecule um, to basically then add the next nucleotide. So this case it will be, let's say, this blue one. And, uh, find, uh, attach that on. Uh, fire a laser, take a photo, remove the fluorophore, and then back again. And basically, you can reconstruct the entire sequence of the molecule without having to basically throw away the DNA molecule once you've taken the picture of just that single nucleotide. Um, and this normally happens with the luminous sequencing somewhere between 50, in either categories of 50, apologies for the helicopter. Normally happens at 50, 75, or 125 times. And these are also known as cycles. Okay, this is sort of what you should have been seeing like earlier in, this an in an animation. You should see a big black square with all these colored dots. So these, the big black square is your flow cell, and all these colored dots are these different clusters, each representing a single DNA molecule, which has been copied lots and lots and lots of times. And so what you can imagine, sort of like in like a, a video or a film, where basically you've got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of single shots just sped up over time, you add the first... So you have your flow cell, your DNA cluster is bound to the, the flow cell, you add the nucleotides, you fire the laser, and when you fire the laser, you should see basically a color being emitted. So in this case, green here and here, this is another DNA molecule, which is yellow, blue, um, and you take the picture. And then you know that a green is only attached to T's, and so basically you see a T molecule being picked up. So you record a T. You remove the fluorophore, you add wash those away, add the new fluorophores, the next base pair, the, the nucleotide will be bound onto the molecule, you apply the laser, it will emit this time a blue. And this means you have a G. Then you again cut the fluorophore off, add the new ones, fire the laser, emits a red. And so this is how you basically reconstruct all of these molecules. And again, the flow cell has millions and millions of these points, um, of these, these colored dots. And this is why you can sequence so many different DNA molecules all at once. Now, again, you have in your head these four colors before because you've seen the animation or also this picture, but there is um, differences to this. So there's actually two different, with aluminum sequencing, there's two different methods of actually um, emitting light. One is called the four channel system or four color chemistry, where each nucleotide has a distinct color. But there's also on particularly the NexSeq and NovaSeq machines a slightly different system where they call they try to make it a bit cheaper um, by only using two colors or two dyes. And the approach they take there is that um, again a T is green, red is a, a C is a red. However, in this case, an A is actually um, two colors mixed at once. So if you emit that both, so if the machine picks up two colors, two wavelengths are being um, emitted, that is an A. However, if there is no color being emitted at all in that cluster, um, the machine reads this as a G or a no detected dye. So this is very important for some caveats and or things you have to consider when processing your data a bit later on. 
Um, so something you have to consider, though, is we're dealing with biology. It is not like, I don't know, chemistry or, or even sort of physics, where things are perfect and wonderful. Over time, um, errors start happening. We're not perfect. Um, essentially, the imaging reagents start getting tired. The polymerases start adding mistakes or don't bind on properly, and more errors will occur. So sometimes your nucleotides will not bind, um, meaning you'll skip a base or you'll get multiple um, uh, nucleotides being added once and you go forward one. And essentially within your cluster, the DNA molecules being uh, sort of replicated and emitting light will get desynced. So the, the color will get a bit blurry and less clear. And so firstly, the machine does calculate something called a base quality. So it calculates the probability that it thinks it caught, captured the right color, so the right nucleotide for each photo. But to the point where if it has no idea, it will call a dead base call, which will be reported as an N. And this became more and more of a, of a problem, particularly in the early days of, the, of sequencing. And so people thought, how can we improve or improve, correct such sort of errors? And the, the, the idea that came up um, was paired end sequencing. So what this means is you do one sequencing in one direction, then you flip the entire read over and then read it from the other end. So whereas you have to consider that in, when you're in the forward direction, over time you're getting more and more errors. So the, the, as the further you get into the molecule, the less confident you are, and so the more errors are going to be. If you then turn it over and start the whole thing from scratch with fresh reagents, uh, by going from the reverse end of forward, you basically can correct the mistakes um, that were occurring at the end of the forward, uh, the, the, the forward sequencing, but get the high quality calls from the other end from the beginning. So you can sort of, sorry, that was a bad explanation. But you can sort of see here, you read it once in this direction. So you read the, prime, the, the DNA insert and the prime, the index. You turn it over and you do the same thing, but from the beginning. So you basically sequence the same DNA molecule twice. An added bonus of this is also you get more cycles. So if your DNA molecule is actually longer than the cycles, it's 50 or 75 base pairs, by going from the other end, you can capture any DNA nucleotides which you are missing um, from the forward sequencing. This is not so necessarily relevant to ancient DNA. We've got typically very short DNA molecules, but in some cases that will apply. Then it comes on to biological to computational sequences. How do we take these um, um, sort of very raw nucleotide sequences and put it into a format that, that a computer can read? Um, this typically happens in a step called demultiplexing. It's actually very rare that you yourself as students will have to deal with this or do with this. Typically, this is done by sequencing centers or by your, your lab team. But what this essentially consists of is normally, um, well, or rather, Often nowadays, there is two steps of this which are stuck together, which colloquially known as demultiplexing. The first step is called um, base calling. This is where you basically take your photo files of every single nucleotide and convert this into an ACT and G. Um, so taking image files, putting it into a text file. But also, in most cases, we have um, mul sequenced multiple samples at once, and all the samples have these barcodes or indices. And we need to actually separate these out. So you know that all of these DNA molecules come from this sample, or these DNA sample, sorry, DNA molecules come from this sample. And this happens in this demultiplexing step. So essentially, the, uh, a computer program will read in each DNA molecule whether it, it finds such a barcode um, a corresponding to one sample. Let's say, in example here, the red one, that corresponds to sample one and the reverse here and that the machine will basically sort or order the DNA molecules accordingly so all of the DNA molecules which have these combination of indices will put into sample one sample two so the, the blue and yellow will go here and so on so this is something you again rarely will have to do yourself but it's something just to, be, to, to keep in mind and the output of this demultiplexing step is something called a fastq file so this is a text-based format for storing biological sequences, in 99% of cases, nucleotide sequences, but also with the base quality score. So these are the things where the computer tries to estimate the probability that it thinks that the nucleotide call was correct. And um, both are enco encoded basically with ASCII uh, text characters. It doesn't really matter what they, that are, they are if you're not familiar with that. 
So this is a very, very small example. These files can be gigabytes in size, so huge, huge text files, typically compressed, but it's still a gigabytes after being compressed. But what they all they are made up of, of basically a repeating set of four different lines. You have the first line up here, and this is called the ID line. This stores multiple information from the sequencer, so the sequencing um, the, the, or the, the sequencing machine ID, then a run number, a flow cell ID, so each flow cell will have an ID from the manufacturer, and then you have a, essentially a bunch of coordinates uh, going on here, which basically tells you from which cluster on the flow cell um, uh, has the DNA molecule come from. Then you can have a bunch of extra information. This is often quite random, depending on the sequence kind of what they put in here, but often people put things like uh, barcodes, um, maybe sort of which, uh, um, how many uh, errors were allowed during gene multiplexing, because you can do a certain amount of filtering during that step. On the second line, you have the DNA sequence itself. So in this case, it starts with an N. This is their base call. This is actually quite often uh, common, because this is when the camera is still calibrating itself. And so the, the first base is often a bit rubbish. But then the rest of the molecules you can see, sorry, the, the sequence here is A, C, Ts, and Gs. This is your DNA molecule. You'll then have a plus, which is a separator. And the fourth line of this repeating set of four is then the base quality score. So these are random, sort of a random set of characters, um, which I'll explain in a second. But basically this tells you the confidence of that, how good we think that that nucleotide call was. And then you can basically see the same thing here on the, the next line. And he repeats it as follows. Well. So you can see, for example, this number is a bit different because it's from a slightly different coordinate cluster. So these quality scores, um, they are not uniform, I have to say. So it depends on the, both the age of the machine and on which, what the manufacturer selected. But typically, they will look something like this. Where there is a fixed order in the, in the ASCII characters. And each one will correspond to a different probability or FRED score. Um, I won't explain exactly what that is. It's a bit mathsy, um, but essentially what it means is the, the higher the character along this score, the more confident you are of the base call, um, because the probability that it's incorrect um, is sort of uh, low. Um, so, to recap, uh, DNA molecules are essentially made of, of nucleotides, A, T, C, C, A, C, Ts, and Gs. We have two strands, which is complementary base pairings, C to G, CGI, AT, Atat Walker, Star Wars, it's great. Uh, modern DNA is very long, but AT DNA is very short. And this is very good for NGS sequencing, where we do this massive multiplexing. So where rather than trying to sequence few very long DNA uh, molecules, we sequence lots and lots and lots and lots of very short ones at very high accuracy, which we can then um, uh, reconstruct the long sequences later on, if you've got a good DNA. Um, so, and the main steps are adding the adapters to create, create something called a library, which allows the DNA your, your DNA molecules to bind to the glass slide, the flow cell, uh, on something called a lawn. You then basically make a new strand. Each cycle, you basically add a fluorescent nucleotide, which you can fire a laser at, which emits a color. You can take a photo, and by basically recording the order of the colors being emitted in a single point in the flow cell, you can reconstruct the DNA sequence. This desyncing de de of clusters results in lower base quality scores over time. So you can also improve this by paired end sequencing, where you basically sequence from one end and then do turn it around and sequence from the other end with fresh uh, reagents. So for the last section of this uh, of this lecture, I want to give a few give you a few ideas of things you should consider when you're um, dealing with DNA for ancient metagenomics. Some of those are applicable to modern genomics too, but it's um, Things I, I find that, through my career, um, people forget about some cases. So firstly um, is low DNA preservation. So when you're dealing with ancient DNA, your samples are very old and often you have very little DNA in the sample. Um, and during library preparation, you may have to do lots and lots and lots of amplification, make lots and lots and lots of copies um, of your DNA to make a sufficient amount to actually put the sequencing. Um, and this is important, and will be discussed later uh, during the week, but this is important because during library construction, you can actually inflate your counts um, for, in terms of DNA molecules that come from a particular taxon, microbial taxon, for example, um, and basically skew your estimate of which uh, species are in your sample or not, or were in your sample, because they're now dead. 
Um, also, by over-amplifying your, your DNA molecules, you reduce the number of sequence reads you actually get out there. Um, by having these duplicate molecules, you're not actually providing any more extra information about your DNA library. And your sequencing flow cell only has a fixed number of sequencing slots, um, which basically, if you've over-amplified your library, um, will basically fill up your slots and you will not sequence as many unique reads and so the amount of information you're getting out of your DNA molecule um, uh, can be problematic. So this is actually quite, I've jumped ahead quite a bit in terms of detail here, but this is, I wanted to have the slides here for you to go back to and um, recap later. Another thing during sequencing you have to consider is something called index hopping. So this is a, a, a problem particularly with Illumina sequence or people are aware of with Illumina sequencing um, and it's a challenge when you're doing multiplex sequencing, when you're sequencing lots and lots of samples at once and you have to have these indexes or barcodes which allow you to identify this DNA molecule comes from this sample. This seems to happen more often on a type of flow cell which you find on the Illumina HiSeq X and NovaSeq um, machines um, and is ultimately caused by free-floating index primers. And why that is a problem is that if you do not sufficiently clean up your primers during the clustering process, you can accidentally start adding on or switching um, barcodes between DNA molecules. This does happen at a relatively low uh, 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 rate, but it does happen. And so what it means is that essentially you switch the barcodes and you may accidentally assign a DNA molecule from one sample into another sample when you're doing T-multiplexing. And so let's say you're doing, dealing with a microbiome sample and you have lots of Let's say, unless you have an oral microbiome sample and a gut microbiome sample, you may start seeing, for example, oral species popping up in your, or uh, sort of oral species which are only found in the mouth, ending up in your gut samples, which may be a bit weird. Um, this can also be a particular problem if you're doing microbial um, genomics, so doing, let's say, pathogen reconstruction, if you're working on that. Um, and you're, you mix capture results with your shotgun samples because then you may start picking up the high amount of um, capture results in your shotgun samples where you're doing screening. So you may start getting false positives there. There's quite a few papers on this, also in the context of engine DNA. So Van der Waal has got quite a good paper to understand that and also how to correct uh, such or estimate the level of this in your in your um, studies. Um, they go back to the sequencing, you have to consider your sequencing errors. So if you don't sufficiently quality control and check for these errors happening in your DNA sequencing, um, you may start actually start um, incorporating errors into your analyses downstream. So for example, what, what may happen is if you have a low base quality score, the machine may have picked up the wrong base or the wrong nucleotide, and this means that your DNA molecule or sequence, when you compare to reference genome databases or reference genomes, may start going to the wrong place or match the wrong uh, reference genome because you have the wrong nucleotides, the wrong sequence, um, which can be a problem. Also, it can reduce your chance of getting, getting sufficient overlap during de novo assembly, which is where you basically stick together all of the overlapping the DNA molecules together to try and reconstruct the entire um, Molecule. This is something that Alex will present on Thursday, Alex Hübner. And also if you're doing variant calling for phylogenomics and you have very low coverage, this may also start increasing, uh, increasingly add errors and you will do the wrong SNP call, which means that basically your um, the relationship between your, your genomes in your tree, for example, will be skewed. And so it's always very important to check for such errors and check that your sequencing run was high quality. You also have to consider, so this is again sort of jumping ahead, but there's a reason why I'm putting in this presentation, is dirty genomes. So unfortunately, um, there are many reference genomes which are very dirty. So dirty, I mean, for example, having lots of adapters still in there. Um, and this means you have the problem where if you yourself have not sufficiently cleaned up your DNA library to remove the adapters and removed also in pre-processing, um, you will start seeing weird results. For example, I very, very highly expect that if any of you screen against the NCBI-NT nucleotide database, you will start seeing CARP everywhere. And the reason why is because people somehow got onto the NCBI a whole CARP genome without removing any of their adapters. So you, there's adapter sequences everywhere in the genome. Um, and so whenever you have an adapter in your, in your library, 
this will basically align to the carb genome, and then you'll get carb. Which, particularly if you're trying to look at diet, for example, for, or ancient diet uh, in, in, like, say, microbiome studies, uh, where you look at sort of uh, the calculus, um, you may start seeing carb, even if you're, I don't know, from got samples from, I don't know, Chile or somewhere where carp is not expected to, to find. You also often will find this with zebrafish, so often many, 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 uh, I think it's Darius Rhenio or something like that, which makes no sense because all of these fish comes from one lake in Africa, um, but you see it everywhere in your metagenomic samples. And again, it's because of dirty genomes where they've been vectors or vector, vectors in, in the, into the genome. Another thing is low sequence diversity. So what I mean by this is mononucleotide reads like GGGGG or dinucleotide repeats. Um, this is not so much of an error necessarily when you're doing met metagenomics, but when you come into genomics, genomics, this can be a problem. So the problem with such uh, DNA molecules like this one here, GGGGG, is they're very unspecific. They give you no information. That can come from any species every, anywhere because they are very common across all genomes. Um, so the problem here is that firstly it slows down your processing because basically you are aligning against uh, or comparing of DNA sequence against many, many, many different genomes to ultimately say, I don't know which one it comes from, um, which is unnecessary. And also in some cases it can inflate counts at higher nodes uh, when you're doing an LTA. This will be described later on. But this can be very common. So if you remember this two color chemistry, that, which I mentioned earlier, where you don't have one color per base, but rather if there is no color emitted, um, the machine reads as a G, particularly with NexSeq and NovaSeq data, you will have a lot of these Gs, particularly as we're dealing with um, ancient DNA, which is very short. When you have very short ancient DNA and you don't reach all of your um, cycles, so let's say you're doing 75 base pair cycles, but your DNA molecule is only 50 base pairs, um, you will basically get to the end of your DNA molecule and not add anything else. So you'll start getting these very long tails of Gs at the end of your molecules. And if you don't remove these, this will make it very difficult to correctly align your DNA molecule um, uh, to a reference genome or, or sequence. So be aware to look for these and remove these. Also because it will speed up your processing. So to recap the considerations, a lot of this will make more sense later on in the other sessions, but consider your duplication rate. So check for um, lots of copies of the same DNA molecule in your, in your library. It's a good idea to check for index hopping. So making sure that um, the index combinations that you have in your library are correct and you've so sorted your samples correctly. Always check for sequencing error and remove low quality bases if, if possible. Check for adapters, so to make sure you don't start finding carp everywhere. And also it's a good idea to look for low sequence diversity reads. Um, for example, particularly if you've got next or NovaSeq data, um, because it just slows down uh, your, your results and you get uh, uh, lower quality taxonomic assignment. So, that is it for now. We can go into questions for anything that's been presented just now. And then also what I would do is that we still have time for a little tech support session. So if anyone's had any problems getting onto their Denby node, so I sent the instructions last week, or um, GatherTown or whatever, we can uh, do a little private session to make sure you're all set up and ready for the first session, which will be bare bones bash after the break. So I'll stop sharing for the moment so I can see everybody again. Uh, so if there are any questions, you can go up to the pedestal on the right hand side on the orange uh, spotlight square. And then everybody should hear. Yeah. So Nora, you're still muted, so you may have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Good. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, so I managed to register for the than BI, but I haven't gotten an email with the link. Okay, um, I will. I can send that after. That's fine. Okay. Cool. So a couple of people moving, but no, they stopped. No, no. 
Okay, well, if there's no questions for the time being, um, I will go into the blue room, and if anyone is still having problems accessing... Ah, is UT coming to ask a question? Or just running around? Just running around. Oh, oh Morgan? Uh, yeah. So remember, if you hold down G, you should turn to a ghost and walk through people if you're a bit stuck. Or you can also ask in the Gather Town chat. So if you click on the um, speech bubbles in the bottom right, you can just ask there and I can announce from there. How to design the barcodes? Uh, that's a question from UD. That is um, quite tricky because there's a lot of considerations you have to make when making sure there's a balance and they're not too similar to each other. Often manufacturers have tools which allow you to basically generate this. I believe they also to a certain extent have standard sets which they can also send you that you can request. So um, you yourself do not have to necessarily design these. It depends on your lab. So often I'd say speak to your sequencing center if you, you have them, because um, they will have advice. Uh, I'll check manufacturers. I think most like Agilent and Illumina will also basically have such uh, things for you there. Yeah, sometimes they make it a little hard to find, but you can, you can find them. And um, if you read the Meyer and Kirscher article for building HDMA libraries, they basically provide index sets. Okay, did, could everyone hear Tina then? No? Okay. So she said that often the manufacturers make it a bit hard to find such functionality on their websites and stuff, but you can often do that. But also if you read the sort of classic paper by May and Kirscher 2011, 12, 12 um, they actually have um, the uh, uh, set of barcodes that you can use yourself. So I think that link, that paper is on the website somewhere, but we can also share it with you. How many indices can you use? So, this is a good question. Um, this depends on your strategy and is slowly changing over time. So you can actually choose one index if you want, which is at the beginning of your, um, so this is from Laura, uh, which is the beginning of your molecule. What has been recommended and what the Mayan Kirscher paper introduces double indexing, where you have two at the end, and these are attached to your adapters. What are people, are commonly doing now is actually adding additional barcodes called inline barcodes. So these are very short um, sequences, about seven, seven base pairs, I think, which you actually attach immediately to the DNA molecule before library preparation. So after extraction, before library preparation. And this actually helps you with, um, uh, demul uh, sorry, with correcting for index hopping. So if you read the Van der Valk paper, which I mentioned earlier, we can send the, the the link again later. They also describe how they use these internal barcodes um, to separate it out. So, for example, you will you can get from a manufacturer about 100, let's say, barcodes, but you will normally per li library can have somewhere between one to four separate identifiers. If that answers the question. Again, I can't see everybody, so <laughs> let me see. Can I grid for you? Uh, if you want me to, if, once you ask a question, if you unmute, uh, open your camera, then I can check that it worked. Um, so I think then Anan had a question. But you may need to unmute yourself if you're still muted. Now. Yes. Or oh, as feedback. Yeah. There we go. So um, I have a question regarding the gene calling for Gs. Right? You mentioned that Gs are a characteristic of ancient DNA or sequencing errors. Why is it specifically Gs that are called more often rather than the other bases? The reason, okay, so that is because your DNA molecule is very short. So let's say your, your DNA sequence is only 30 base pairs long, but your sequencing cycles, so the number of cycles of imaging your, your machine is going to do, is let's say 75 base pairs. Once you've got through the 30 base pairs, there is nothing more, to, nothing to sequence anymore. You're not, your light is not going to emit anything. So when you're on NovaSeq and NextSeq data, if no, sorry, machines, if no light is emitted, it reads it as a G. Um, and you have to remember that the machine is not going to stop imaging once your that one DNA molecule is finished. 
the DNA, the sequencing machine will keep taking photos until it's reached to the number of cycles you've set, whether in this case 75. So once you've exhausted your DNA molecule, there's nothing to sequence, um, no, nothing to image anymore. So basically the machine will just keep picking up G for every uh, remaining cycle of the run. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, but still, I don't get why G and not like A, T. Why is it specifically the space? Because on NovaSeq and NextSeq data, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. they've decided G's uh, means nothing. So There's no once color. It, once it runs out of, yeah, I'll mute myself and Tina can speak. Yeah. Uh, but you need to the, the spotlight. spotlight. Okay. So one more. One more. Okay. Hey, can you guys hear me? Um, so yeah, so basically, with the problem with ancient DNA is we often have very short reads. So you might do, say, two by seventy-five sequencing, which is very common, but you might have a read that's only fifty bases long. And so once it kind of runs out uh, of DNA, it will just it won't sequence anymore. So there'll be no more fluorophores. And because the NovaSeq um, and, and the NextSeq interpret that um, as a G, you'll just get these poly G tails. But actually, it just means no more data. Um, another thing is uh, could you mute yourself? Another thing is uh, this may also happen in modern data as well. If you've fragmented your modern data too short, you'll also get that. It's just that in the context of ancient DNA, the reason why I said that is because we are naturally already very very short because of the degradation. And I'll also say this is a, this is if you're used to doing modern DNA, this is where it's really different because let's say you're sequencing a, like a regular library. What you would normally do for modern DNA is you have genomic DNA, which is huge. So for your microbial DNA, you know, each genome is something like three million bases long, and that's way too big for an Illumina machine. So what you would do is you would shear it either enzymatically or by sonication, usually to an average size of about 500 bases. And then you do your Illumina sequencing, usually two by 150. So you kind of measure one side, then you measure the other side, and you get a total of 300 bases sequenced out of the 500 base pair read. You never run out of DNA. You never actually get to the end of the molecule when you're sequencing. Um, and so for most people that do modern DNA sequencing, they've never dealt with this problem before because they never see it because they're always sequencing a DNA molecule longer than what their sequencing chemistry can actually do. For ancient DNA, it's very different. We actually don't shear. We take advantage of the fact that because our DNA is short, we don't have to shear. And because we don't shear, it actually allows us to exclude some of the modern contamination because any modern DNA that's in there will be so long that it won't build a proper library and it won't be sequenced. And so it, um, it kind of helps us clear out some of the modern DNA that might be present. Um, and so we would um, so we, we just we will only sequence the the short DNA sequences which are more likely to actually be ancient. But the problem there is we're dealing with the real size of the ancient DNA, which might be ten bases, thirty bases, fifty bases, seventy five bases. Um, we we don't have a uh, necessarily the kind of consistency you would have if you were you know, intentionally sharing modern DNA. So we do have some sequences that are very short. Okay, so Liazat asked, when we're talking about whole genome sequencing, so WGS and full genome sequencing, FGS, is it the same? I've never heard of FGS, so yes, I would say it probably is. Um, and then Jaime asks, is, I hope I'm saying that right, um, is this kind of pro program publicly available? Is the this to, checker. sorry? To the index checker to make sure your pools don't. Um... If it's the index checker, uh, yes. So again, lots of tools online, I think, basically to make sure there's there's no overlap. Normally, the manufacturer will offer such such um, such thing. And then talking about poly G, poly Gs, they're also a way of removing that. So the most common tool is something called FastP, um, and we'll also be looking at that a little bit tomorrow um, in the eager session. 